Welcome to the 19.9 podcast. On today's episode, we have Josh Swade. Josh is an American documentary filmmaker and author known for directing the 2012 ESPN 30 for 30 documentary, There's No Place Like Home, and writing the corresponding book, The Holy Grail of Hoops, One Fan's Quest to Buy the Original Rules of Basketball. We're going to get into the documentary, his passion for hoops, and the 1988 Kansas team. If you haven't already checked out the Kansas gear on 19.9.com, what are you waiting for? I've got the practice shorts, uh, uh, the 1990 game shorts on my wish list already. But let's get started. Josh Barnett, what's going on, man? What's happening, man? Josh Wade, how are you? A lot, a lot of Josh's here. I'm good. I'm good. <laughs> no, we, get the, we get the double Josh. I'll start calling him Barnett from here on out. Here on out. That's usually what I call him that anyways. Works. <laughs> well, let's start out here, uh, Josh. I loved uh, – just the documentary rewatched it i know you were, you were saying it's been a been a long time but you lived it so I, i'm just kind of curious like how i'm always curious like how something like that begins to come together like it's an idea but how do you get to a, like a documentary from just your crazy idea like i think that's so cool uh man that's it's kind of a loaded question but i think some things are just kind of meant to be and that was one of these situations where uh, I read about the auction for the rules about five or six weeks before the auction took place. There was an article in the, in the New York Times and Sotheby's, I live in New York and Sotheby's is right around the corner. I mean, it's very close. So what are the chances that, you know, a you know, crazy lunatic Kansas fan lives around the corner from the most famous auction house in the world and, and I can just go you know, literally just hop, pop in and check out, check out this auction that's coming out, coming up in five weeks time. And so when I went to Sotheby's to just take a look at, at this display, it just kind of hits you. I mean, it's almost like seeing, you know, the 10 commandments or something. I mean, it really does jump off the page. It's or the pages, I should say. It's more than simply, um, is that me making that? That annoying. It might. You're fine, that. though. That's that's it that's that for us. Yeah. Okay. Um, sorry about that. Anyways, I don't know. I don't know, know if we told you or not, but nobody listens to this shit anyway. So I mean, you can do whatever you want. <laughs> All right. Good. Good. Um, well, you know, was blown away and just thought these things have to be at KU. You know, like you could make an argument they should be at the Basketball Hall of Fame. I just felt as a as a Kansas fan, having lived and experienced and loved Kansas basketball, Allen Fieldhouse, the history of Kansas basketball. There was really only one place for them. And, you know, just kind of took a ragtag crew, worked in television, took a, a, a bare bones, like the cheapest crew I could put together. And we hit the road and, and tried to make something happen. And lo and behold, you know, sometimes if you just take that for, I mean, it, it sounds cliche and corny and you've heard all these adages in, in life before, but if you just kind of move it in one direction, things start to happen. And, and that was an unbelievable example of like one thing led to an, another, led to another, led to another. And the next thing you know, auction day, we're in the conference room of a billionaire who's like, doesn't want to lose. I mean, his competitive juices kicked in and he didn't want to lose. And we didn't really know we were bidding against a Duke alum. You know, we didn't know. We had some hunches to some things, but nobody really knew what was at stake or who we were bidding against. And he, this guy, David Booth, just is a competitive guy as a lot of these success, uber successful people are. And somehow we win. And you know, when you have an experience like that and you're capturing it on camera, there's going to be some options in terms of where it gets shown. And ESPN, I think, was one of the most natural places to sort of say, hey, we we just shot the shit out of this four week journey. And they said, holy, you know, we want to be we want to be the ones to show it. So that's kind of I how was it um, I was uh, 
I don't know. I, I was really obsessed with the documentary, the, the There's No Place Like Home. But number one, like, you can't tell with our backgrounds right now, but our whole studio down here is just like basketball memorabilia. So number one, that stuck out to me. And then number two, your passion really came through. And I was like, holy shit, this guy's just like me. Um, if I knew that the rules of basketball were coming up for sale, like I might have been up there with a group bidding against this dude. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> Trying to get him for, for Indiana or whatever, you know, the case may be. Um, but we like the, the thing that Meyer and I kept talking about was the time frame that you guys put it together in. So I think when the documentary starts, you're at like 27 days or something till auction or something, or maybe 30 days, but it was, it wasn't like you had this, like, at least the way the video was set up or it showed, it wasn't like a six month run that you had to build oh, all of these assets to get, um, all the ducks in a row. Like this had to be happening boom, boom, boom in real time. And so my question was, you got to meet with Roy Williams, you got to meet with Larry Brown, you got to meet with the Boos um, and Fog Allen's grandson and all that stuff. Like, how did that all come together in such a, uh, a tight um, deadline, timeline? Um, yeah, you're right. We only had a month. And uh, it's just one of those things where, like, you know, people who share your love and passion for something – when you approach them, they, they're down to, to talk to you. I mean, it, it sounds crazy that Roy, Roy Williams would just open up his office to us and let us come in there and interview him. Here he is coaching North Carolina. But, you know, the guy loves and loved his time at KU. And so those kinds of things that, you know, and then, you know, local news and media in Kansas City was instrumental in helping us spread the word. Uh, I went on a radio, a couple of radio shows, and there were, um, there was a uh, a TV news piece done, and people watch that stuff, especially back then. I think more so than now, or listen to the radio, and <laughs> that led us to the Allen family. You mentioned Fog Allen's grandson, so it was just a simple kind of local news radio program that got us in with the Allens. You get in with the Allens, I mean you know, the Indiana equivalent, I guess it'd be the Knights or something like that, you know, or the McCrackens or someone, you know, like it, it's going to open up some doors there. And uh, it just, the doors kept opening and we would go in them with all the passion we could, you know. You could see the exasperation kind of growing each, each door that opens. You're kind of like, is this going to happen? Because at first it seems like kind of a pipe dream where we're like, I just want to shoot my shot. And even if it doesn't happen, at least I gave it a, I gave it a try with this. But then you get the the million dollars pledged there, and it and it's like it, it starts to like crystallize a little bit. You're like, man, we might actually, you uh, know, be at least I really, in it. You know? Yeah, I really love the scene where you call your dad and your dad's like, holy shit. <laughs> <laughs> like, I've had that I've had that experience with my dad so many times, like growing this company, because when this company yeah. started, we were in my basement, you know, in in uh, my house. And, you know, nobody really saw what this could eventually be. So now every time I call my parents with like good news of we're going to launch in Kansas tomorrow or uh, my dad's a big Tennessee fan. Like, Dad, we got Tennessee. His reaction is always like, holy shit. Like, same thing. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, it's always funny. Like, university? <laughs> yeah, you right. Know, you, guys know, you guys know that, like, you're not born – you're not born loving this stuff. Like, it's got to get – I think it's got to get passed down. Like, to be as crazy as we all are, like, yeah. it comes from somewhere. And, it, you know, and so – yeah, there was definitely like along the way, like, holy shit, like we're, we're getting in, this is moving, like this might be, at the very least, like maybe we're actually going to be bidders. Like just the fact that we could show up on auction day and place any bid felt like a win. Right. It didn't have to be the winning bid. I and, also and thought it was a... I thought it was funny as like after you guys did the news thing and you were getting people calling in pledging like fifty dollars and a hundred dollars and you could tell how much that like meant to you because everybody it's like that shared passion you know but then there's also that realization like man this is awesome but that's not gonna get it done like this we we, we need a heavy yeah. hitter here <laughs> exactly exactly you want you know you need like people and anything I'm sure when you're building your business like like people to buy in and say, I see your vision. Like I'm down for the, the, what sure. you're trying to do here. But the, at the end of the day, like, you know, they're not going to necessarily get 
you the Kansas license or get you the Tennessee license. It's it, it it's you in the trenches trying to get that license, right? So, yeah, you know, it was a tricky deal where like at the end of the day, we just needed a David Booth like miracle or someone like a David Booth and the guy. I mean, you know, how lucky is Kansas to have, you know, he's kind of like your Mark Cuban, right? Right. Yeah. I was going to say that. Who might be coming through uh, for a coach here. And, and... Don't, don't <laughs> Meyer, Meyer, come on, Meyer. That's a different pod. Don't get me excited know, on, the, on the IU coaching search right now. You know what you're doing over there in that other room. So just stop. <laughs> I want to be a part of that pod too. That's right. <laughs> but hey, you honestly, Josh, if you want to be a third co-host, you can come on this thing anytime you come want. Anytime. <laughs> it's good, bro. Hey, I got I got while while I've got you already sidebarred. I'm gonna sidebar the sidebar. How did you get the music for the documentary? Because that took me back to like the 2010s. Because I, I was like, man, the, the, the music budget for this documentary had to be pretty good. Because you got like the black keys on there and. So just some, it, it really fits and just is kind of fun, uh, fun way to move the, the documentary forward. I, I would say like for that stuff, you know, we definitely like recognized that like this was not going to be your typical 30 for 30, which at the time, if you think about what like that series was, it was more or less like look, look backs at, at, at things that had taken place. And this was sort of unfolding uh, as it went along. And in that respect, we really wanted the doc to be quirky and you know because it was i mean that's what it was inherently and it just felt like some of those those music selections were were necessary to make it feel special and different than your typical just kind of talking head documentary Mm -hmm. and i will say that there's this great thing that can happen in entertainment in in the music business too where if you pitch managers and publishers and record labels on like why this makes sense and it's art for art's sake and all that shit they'll listen sometimes and we did get some people to say yeah we 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 see what this is and we see that this is different and we know that you don't have a huge budget but we're down to support what you're trying to do yeah that's dope um question like the, the the part and we'll get off the documentary here in a second and we'll get into kansas basketball but um the part, the ending scene where you're in the conference room with the with David Booth, um, and I, is it his daughter that was in there too? I think I believe Bill or, Bradley was in there. So no, no one. Oh, oh, you're saying actually, when you guys were actually bidding? Yeah, doing the bidding. Uh, it was his wife. Oh, his wife. His wife. Okay, I couldn't remember if it was, if it was his yeah. wife or daughter. It's been a while, but um, when you're in there, you're just kind of in the background, and I can see with like every bid, like your stomach is just like churning can you describe like what being in that room but you're in a room so you're part of it but you're really not a part of it because it's not your money and you're but you want this thing so damn bad and you you have no control over it can you describe like what that call it 25 minutes or however long it was uh you know what you were going through uh i think like one great analogy not to keep like hammering home like the fact that you guys are from indiana but like was it Gordon Hayward who took the shot against Duke that hit yeah. the backboard and goes in? Yeah. yeah. The, yeah, yeah. Difference, the difference between winning and losing is, you know, it's so small on in one respect, but you know, too, that hit in terms of history, it's everything. And I knew in that moment that once it was getting up in the $3 million range and, and that sort of thing that like, I, I didn't want to look, but I could hear he was slowing down and I was just dying inside because I didn't <laughs> want to lose. Yeah. I didn't want to lose because I knew at that point that second place wasn't good enough. It was really nice of the Duke guy too, to uh, pause for a long time and really make Booth start sweating it out. He, he was getting <laughs> pissed, wasn't he? He was. I mean, he was pissed off and who knew that like auction houses allowed that kind of delay. <laughs> oh, oh, right. Know. Yeah, like that's a thing. It. You can just take your sweet ass time. I didn't know that. Now, what's crazy is you said this was ten years ago, and I don't know. I don't know if you're a big collector or not, or if you you follow sports memorabilia. But he got that at like three point four million, something like that, so along that was, range. And then after the fees and stuff, it went over four, I think. Yeah, it was four point um, three. But if that comes up on auction today, 
I have to imagine that you're in the $10 million range on that shit now. I mean, I got to think, if not 20, you know, know. just with, with what, what's going on. I know baseball cards and, you know, that stuff's kind of a different beast or whatever, but you know, there's a lot of wall street money in, in that thing. I would think that this deal would have gone for damn near $20 million. So really, the booth, the booth should thank you for making them buy at such a bargain price. Um, I, they really should. I mean, that's the more. <laughs> you know, we got in. We, we, I saw, I saw the deal way before anyone else. So, yeah, you did. No, we stole it. I think we stole it. I really do. Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, and I, I was curious if that, you know, kind of wrapping up here on, on this but has your relationship to kansas changed after the documentary and after all that uh all that went down i know you got to go back that was so cool like introducing it but even going going past uh past that time well you know if you recall in the film uh we had some issues with them because you know here i am some you know joe schmo off the street running around talking to their wealthiest boosters right <laughs> and that pissed them off and i could at the time I understood it, I've always understood that. Like, they don't want that, you know? But at the same time, from my standpoint and perspective, it wasn't about me and it wasn't about them or who the AD was. And there was no AD at the time, which was another issue. Uh, it was about forever, you know? And so what I would say is like, when they hired a new AD, and he came in, this guy, uh, Dr. Shane Zanger, who's no longer the AD there. To his credit, he really understood that this was not me versus the university. You know, there, none of that stuff, ma all that mattered was we were preserving and enhancing, you know, the story of Kansas basketball. So I would say that my relationship with the university, first of all, as a basketball fan, nothing changed and nothing will ever change it remains and always has been you know outside of like my two kids like the most important thing going in my life you know um as far as like my relationship with the school you know we just celebrated the 10-year anniversary they asked me to to write a little something that that uh commemorated the 10 years and it's great cool. you know i got friends there it's all good it's all good well, can you take us to a game? That's our, that's my follow up question to that. You guys haven't been, you haven't been to a game there. We've not been uh, to Fog Allen, uh, man. Oh man, I know. I'm dying, dying. We have a pay heed sign up in the room next to me too, hang, that hangs over our TV daily that I look at every day and know that I have to get to to Fog Allen Fieldhouse, but uh, awesome. it hadn't happened yet. And we were going to do it this year, and obviously this year was a little yeah, bit different. So hopefully next year. Uh, I would love to go to a game with you guys and, and show you everything there is to show you. It's a great town. Awesome. I've never been to Assembly Hall either, so we can. Oh, there we go. A home and home. And home. There you go. Let's make there it happen. Go. I'd love. I'd love that. It'd be amazing. Okay, so our uh, our emphasis in Hardwood Heaven, our our thing that we have going right now during the Final Four, when this uh, when this airs, like I was talking to you about, um, it's just this basketball utopia that we created, um, and obviously we created it using some of our current licenses and, and telling out, uh, bringing out and telling the best stories in college basketball um, with the schools that we have licensed in, in our product. And one of the schools that we chose was obviously Kansas, who has a uh, great tradition. Um, and then we did a focus and emphasis on the 1988 Danny and the Miracles team. So um, we're bringing out their shorts. The shorts are available for purchase now if you're listening to this um, or will be when this airs. And uh, I wanted to know kind of where that 88 team ranks on your personal list of all time KU teams, or if you had any uh, recollection or memories of the team growing up, you were probably decently young, but probably enough to, to remember um, some of it. So uh, anything from the 88 season that you can share? Yeah, I mean, you know, uh, I was 13. So I, I remember Wheelhouse. everything, you know, I remember That's a lot. Perfect. Uh, and, you know, Danny decided to come back to school, right? So that was a big deal. And I think there was a lot of optimism entering the season. And there were always rumors about uh, Larry Brown leaving. You know, I mean, that was the nature of Larry Brown even in 1987 going into 88. 
And the fact that we had both those guys returning, uh, there was a big, you know, a lot of reason to be optimistic. And then the season really just kind of unraveled. I mean, the team struggled. And at one point, I think it, it looked like this wasn't gonna be, even going to be an NCAA tournament team. Um, and, you know, famously, Duke came into our building. In fact, that's the game the guys first put the pay heat banner up for you know okay. the, the pay heat banner is very central to to this season and so the guys uh put the banner up for the duke game it was a big game because it was towards the end of the season with a chance to kind of get a big win duke was ranked top 10 team and we blew a lead game goes to overtime and we lose in overtime and uh it looked like that might be the nail in the coffin on this on the year, but we turned it around shortly thereafter, won the next few games and ended up, if I'm not mistaken, get, getting a six seed to yep. go into the tournament. And, uh, you know, whenever you got the best player on any court, you know, in, in any game you're going to play, you have a shot, you right? Got a shot. Exactly. You got a shot. And so we knew we always, you know, Oklahoma – that Oklahoma team, I mean, it was really kind of like good team, right? Like you know, Stacy King, Mookie Blaylock, uh, Billy Tubbs is always underrated too. Like he he, he doesn't get brought up player. anymore, but Billy Tubbs was like a legend. That's that thing about winning and losing, right? Mm-hmm. Like he wins that game. All of a sudden, you know, we think of Billy Tubbs in a very different way. Completely but he different. Was. He, and but he it's, funny, it's funny it's funny in in what we do when we research and get the brain back like we did louisville a few weeks ago denny crumb's mm-hmm. another guy that doesn't get the the probably the credit that he deserves um and he won too you know what i mean it's like totally. it's just why it's so fickle how that that shit plays out I think it's, it really I think it's personality though too denny crumb's such a like level-headed guy the, the kind of watching the louisville uh documentary he doesn't cuss ever you know just not not sure. bombastic in the but way that Bill, billy that. tubbs was fiery though man like he, he yeah, left maybe. the mark yeah yeah he had that tight comb over <laughs> sure did uh, sure did <laughs> he, he was just you know kind of a slick hillbilly kind of thing, right? But, uh, but yeah, you know, we had the best player in the country. And what's crazy about that tournament is we had lost three home games that year outside of the Duke game. So, or no, I'm sorry, including the Duke game. We had lost at home to Kansas State, Duke, and Oklahoma. Those were our three home losses. We beat all three of those teams to win the national championship. Yeah, like a redemption tour. Yeah, it's like crazy. Yeah. That's but I mean, crazy. you know, who would have thought that that team had no business even, you know, playing for and, win, and then winning a title? You know, you're wearing a hat commemorating 50 years of, of the NCAA tournament. It took place in Kansas City. That The, you know, the setting, I was. I, I was getting yeah. ready to hit on that, that like Kemper Arena or whatever, and then you had two Big yeah. 12 teams playing in Kansas City. Like the atmosphere on that, I just watched that game not too long ago on YouTube, I think, and the atmosphere of that game was like high level. Like you could feel the energy even now, and that's shit 30 years ago, you know? Totally. And back then it was it was it was a Big Eight, right? Like it wasn't a yeah, Big well, Eight. That's right. Yeah. Did, you to, did you get to go to any of the games? Well, the crazy thing is. You know, I always give my dad a hard time because I'm the oldest of five kids. And like, you know, he wasn't about to uh, shell out the money necessary to go to that game. I mean, Kemper, I don't know what it it held or. It's not that big. I, I, I grew up playing uh, peewee soccer in there, actually. Cause I, oh, I, did I, you really? The <laughs> yeah. And so he he wasn't going to start. We watch a game at home is what I'm getting at. And yeah. I still give him a hard time, you know, like, how do we not go to that, that final four and that national, you know, but at the same time, what it did for me is it now in my life now, if I got a shot and I can figure out a way to get to a final, if Kansas is playing in the final four, you better believe I'm trying to get there. So like, I'm kind of living the life in response to the fact that we didn't go to that final four. Yeah. Cause I, cause I will, fucking buy the cheapest ticket 
anybody selling and just sneak down. I'll figure sure, out a way. Absolutely. All, 100%. All I'm worried about is me. You know, but <laughs> yeah, I my yeah. brother. Yeah. But my brother's right there. <laughs> with me. I'll take care of him. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> It is oh. funny, like my my dad too. Like we grew up loving sports, and my my number one sports memory is why I was eight, seven when when IU won their last Natty. As embarrassing as that is for us to admit, um, but I remember like I remember the whole scene of being in the hotel in Indy because he was traveling for work, but we all got together up there, and like it's still my favorite sports memory. But we didn't go to shit. Like never went to anything, <laughs> you know what I mean? Oh, it's like I, I do the same thing now with my son. You know, COVID year is COVID year, but uh, with yeah. my son, I'm like, we're gonna try to go to a few things just so we can we can do that stuff. You know, like there's and no reason way, not to. And Josh, it's not a knock on your dad, right? Like no, exactly. I'm, yeah, hundred yeah, percent. And he passed down the most important thing, which is the love. You know, sometimes I think that's a curse, though, too, if you're an IU fan and a Tennessee football <laughs> fan like I am. Like, it's been a long 15, you're 20 years, team. brother. Totally. <laughs> but, it, it's a, but, but for me, too, it, it's a blessing. It's also a curse. But it's more of a blessing. For sure. <laughs> it, it is a curse. It's a curse. Because, you know, look, I know you guys have been through tough times, uh, way tougher than we have. But, you know, the Kansas story is pretty full of peaks and valleys. I mean, it really is. It's not an easy fandom. It really is. It, from the outside looking in, I think people can think that sometimes because there's a, a level of consistency there. But we've had some ch fucking choke jobs. I mean, I think to the outsider looking in, like uh, conference titles, whatever, I don't know what, you know. But it's been painful. When we did, I, I've always, the, yeah, I was gonna say, I've always been amazed that, that um, I've always been amazed with Kansas resiliency, though. Uh, Kansas, Carolina, um, Kentucky, I think, are the three blue bloods that um, don't stay down long. So if they're if they are down, they'll make the moves to get it right to get back up. Um, and yeah. I think it's really tough. Like you guys have replaced legends. Carolina has replaced legends. Kentucky has replaced legends. That's not an easy thing to do. And there might be a dip for a few years, but you guys, those three programs always seem to find their footing where others toil in mediocrity for 20 years. You know, I, I think it's just an amazing thing that Kansas has done, honestly. Yeah. You know, people the blue blood discussion, I know there's a million ways to slice that. I do think you're, you're right. You know, without sounding too much like a homer, I think that the most undervalued stat is winning percentage. I think winning percentage is tells the biggest story. It doesn't tell the story about national championships necessarily, or even final four or any of that, but it, it tells like the story, mm -hmm. right? And, and those three programs, if I'm not mistaken, maybe Duke's up there, I'm pretty sure the only ones to win over 70% of their games. And Duke's going to be fascinating to watch once K leaves because you don't know which, which category they fit in right now. Right now they have their Bob Knight on steroids. You know what I mean? That's we right. had our Knight for 30 years, and it was like once he left, it was like, okay, was that Indiana basketball or was that just Bob Knight basketball? Because we haven't been able to replicate. You know, it's like a – it's going to be fascinating to me to see how Duke uh, replaces K, Michigan State replaces Izzo, and Syracuse oh, right. re replaces Bayheim because all that stuff's coming. And even Roy, you know, Roy, too, at UNC getting replaced. It's, it's going to be very interesting to see what those schools are able to do in that hiring of a, a successor to a legend. 100%. You can't undervalue, in my opinion, luck. Luck plays a part in sure. this, right? Like. Like you could sit like Kelvin Sampson getting hired from Oklahoma. You know, we faced Kelvin Sampson for a decade when he was at OU. Guys, a great, look what he's doing. With I Houston. love Kelvin Sampson. Kelvin Sampson's a great basketball coach. That was my guy, man. He was a great hire at IU. Yep. What went down there is kind of a bunch of bullshit. You bullshit. Know? Like, it's not even illegal now. Right. And like, it wasn't illegal the next year. So that's exactly. Bad. My point is it's bad luck. It's not an IU, pro you know, like we, we can sometimes, I think, make a bigger deal out of things when it can sometimes just be bad luck. Right. 
Right. Does yeah, that make no, sense? I agree. Oh, 100%. Well, that, well, the that, national that, that championship, chips, the national right? championship runs too. The national championship runs hang in the balance of one play. Like IU never wins in 87 if Nikita Wilson from LSU hits that fadeaway jump shot in the regional final. They never get a shot at. You know, it's just so much little stupid stuff. If Key Smart doesn't make that shot, Jim Beheim has two national championships. Like, really? you just don't – it's it's impossible to, to, to quantify the luck aspect of it. For sure. For sure. I mean, didn't we – if I'm not mistaken, Kansas lost to Indiana in a, in a title game by – a point or something like that. Yeah, that was that was back back before our time. Yeah. Oh, that was way before our time. <laughs> but the point being, like, it's a basket, you know. Yeah, it's one. Yeah, no, that's exactly it. You know, that's exactly it. So back to your original question: where where's eighty seven or eighty eight? I'm sorry, rank oh, um, on your all time Kansas teams, personally. Not that they're the best, just you personally as a fan. Um, I'd say it's number one. It's number one for me because it's it's my favorite player, favorite Jayhawk of all time, Danny Manning. Uh, it's you know Larry Brown, who uh, even though Ted Owens is an underrated coach and in, in two, went to two Final Fours, you know uh, Larry kind of like really put us on this trajectory, and it was so Cinderella esque. It's in Kansas City, my hometown, you know. How could that not pay heed banner? I mean, it's it's a special, special year. So for me, and I was, you know, just coming into like loving it as a kid. So that's number one. I love it. I, I think that that team's so fun that you get a little bit of the underdog in there, too. There's something about even, you know, even the last time we went to the final four, that 2002 team being able to watch a team that's under under seated or has to upset people get there. There's just something special about the the excitement that that brings out. Cause it's unexpected and you're not, you don't feel that same pressure either. You're like, well, if we lose, we've had a great run. Right. And then you, you guys just kept going all the way, which is incredible. Wow. Just wild. What's yeah, it, remember that? Yeah. What's okay. the favorite uh, game you've ever seen at the fog? Um, that's a great question. Wow. Uh, Man, I mean, there's been so many. In fact, Jacques Vaughn, I hate to do this to you guys, but there's a game yeah. we beat you, y'all. Yeah, Jacques Kansas Vaughn had our number. Three. You remember that? Do you guys remember? Jacques this Vaughn game? was awesome. I loved watching he Jacques Vaughn was awesome. Yeah. He had a three. I believe it was an overtime. Was that Oster to tag on that team, too? Oster tag was the, on that team. The Oster tag team beat our ass in the tournament like beat the shit out of us like by 30 then 91 or something like that yeah it was it was it yeah. was in that range where we had a really good team and kansas came in like i've i don't think i've ever seen my dad so deflated in my time in my entire life <laughs> wow it, the years get cloudy so that that i'll never forget vaughn hitting that three to beat iu uh you know uh keith langford in overtime against georgia tech on new year's day I was silky at the smooth game. lefty. I loved him. Yeah. Slasher, man. I oh, love. He could go. K freeze. Uh, what are some other great ones? I mean, there's been so many. Uh, you know, uh, Collison and Heinrich. You know, I mean, we beat Texas in a back and forth, just unbelievable game. Collison. You know, Dick Vitale sort of stood up and gave him a standing ovation. It was I remember that. Cool. It was like thirty three yeah. points, twenty rebounds, something crazy yeah, like, like 21 that. Twenty one more, yeah, something like that. Yeah. I was at that game. Um Yeah, there's there's just a bunch. I was not at you know, there's the famous final Kansas Missouri game is a game that, that it was also an overtime game and you know, that's such a rivalry game. Can we get that's that back? To... Okay. It's coming back. It was supposed to come back this year. Oh nice. It's coming back. Yeah, it's coming back. Are they doing it home and home, or do they do it on neutral court? They're doing it in Kansas City on a neutral court. Okay. That'll still be fun, man. It'll be a good time, but it's not yeah. the same. They should they should go home and home. <laughs> I heard a funny story about Nick Collison uh, yesterday that uh, he showed up to play, like, pickup ball in New York City somewhere and uh, starts splashing threes because, of course, it's Nick Collison. He can shoot, too. And the guy asked him if he could play – if he played high school basketball anywhere. <laughs> 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 we were we were watching the tur- we were watching the tournament the day and it was like 
two of the lower seeds or something, and we're just sitting there watching it. And I said to the guys down here, I'm like, can you imagine any of these dudes on the court right now showing up at a rec league? I was like, they would be an absolute <laughs> fucking nightmare. Any of them. Just pick any of them. It doesn't matter who. <laughs> You're playing the vision. Just the speed alone, you know, like – it re- there's such a drastic uh, difference between rec league guys and division one guy. I mean, it's, I know it's just it'll super- blow you away. Even if they can't shoot, it doesn't matter. Know? It doesn't it, matter. It doesn't matter. They're like the top one percent of the top one percent body types in the world. Like they're gonna destroy you. It it it's doesn't not. matter. You don't stand it. <laughs> Well, okay, so our theme, our theme, Josh, is, is Hardwood Heaven, where I was kind of telling you that we, we pieced all these different collections, our collection of stories together and teams that we wanted to tell through the lens of who we have the license for. But it's basically 99's basketball utopia um, through our licensed uh, apparel and stuff in, in, the, in the schools that we have. Um, if you go to basketball heaven, your basketball utopia, Who's the first person that you're you're seeking out to sit down and, and talk with and just chop it up hoops wise? You know, I think my the, the the most obvious answer to that should be probably I mean probably Fog Allen, but for me personally, it's actually not Fog. It's Red Auerbach, and. You know, it's just everything for everything we know about Red Auerbach, uh, what he meant to the game, the way in which he, you know, came from the streets of Brooklyn. You know, there's something I, I love about that and, and was such a self-made guy, uh, was colorblind. You know, I, if I'm not mistaken, was the first guy to start uh, an entire black roster in the NBA uh, you know, had this unbelievable relationship with, um, Russell, the great Russell, Bill Russell, it it made Russell a a player coach. You know, Russell was a coach as you know, won all the tight, all these titles, greatest winning percentage. I just, he was a guy that for me was everywhere all the time, read all the Feinstein book, Feinstein books about him and his love of Chinese food. He just was so inner the cigar I love yeah. him, his character. The most arrogant shit of all time. Like, amazing. Just the the GOAT. He's the GOAT for me. Right. And I'm not even yep. an NBA guy. I'm not an NBA guy, you know? But I, I am a tradition guy. I love, like, East Coast personality, swagger. You know, so he just it checks a lot of boxes for me. He brings it back to college, too. Uh, I don't know if you've read the John Thompson autobiography yet, but he had a huge influence on John Thompson's life because Thompson plays on those Celtics teams uh, and just gets mentored, basically, by Arbach. So that's kind of the you know him passing it back down to the college ranks. And he, he just was one of those guys, you know, like the fi- some of the five-star guys that seemed to touch every corner of basketball, uh, even though he was in the NBA, you know. And, and like, did you guys ever see that uh, incredible? It was actually an ESPN thirty for thirty short on Wilt Chamberlain. Yeah, as a, the, as a bellhop. The oh, Porsche bell, bellhop. Oh, yeah, yeah. Fucking insane, right? It, it turns out our back. He was all up in that. He was <laughs> like the director of entertainment or something yeah. at Cooper's back in. I mean, this guy was everywhere. Everywhere. Literally There's some great. There. There's some great stories in that book that uh, Meyer mentioned. We're gonna, actually going to have Jesse Washington on the pod um, next week to, to to discuss it That's more. Amazing. But uh, yeah, there's some great Red Arbach stories because it's so funny because the NBA recruited regionally there. So if a guy went to college in your region, then you had first rights to draft them. So with John Thompson in Providence, Red Arbach would just like pick him up in his car and they would drive down to some basketball camp or something and just shoot the shit like as a as a college kid and he might have even met him in high school too and stuff it's just crazy you're like god damn how does red arbach know everybody like how does that work about john thompson i mean and john we we think about like what john thompson means to these coaches today and rightfully so the guy was an unbelievable coach trailblazer human being i mean at the 1988 final four i remember my so my dad didn't take me to the final four but he took me to the 
something like you know there's all the hoopla the fan fest or something yeah fan fest but at the time he took me to like the coach's hotel i went up to john thompson to get his autograph and i he he sits there he's talking to someone else he puts his arm around me and it was very much like all right i gotta wait till he's done talking i sat there for what felt like forever it's probably a good five minutes while he had his arm around me uh, around me and then finally he he finishes talking talks to me signs the autograph you know my dad takes a picture i mean that that was the kind of guy john thompson was and i didn't even know that about red hour back in him yeah super interesting yeah Okay, so Myers got one more question for you, but I wanted to say we'll edit this little piece out. But uh, whenever we cut, uh, we need you to hang on the line for a little bit because it takes a while to process the. I don't know, Meyer, you can explain it. You know all the tech shit, but we we want to yeah. make sure that he doesn't hang up right away, right? No, he just has to keep his browser, uh, the browser tab open. So we we'll we'll hang okay. up and stop recording, and then uh, you know just, it, don't close say, the browser. That's what you can it is. See it in the corner, and it'll be uploaded. You can kind of see the progress down there. All right, la- last question then. I-, I just want to find out like what you're you're into next. You know, that I always want to hear what you can tell us or or what you've been working on or anything you can share about what you, what kind of stories you're going to tell because that's that's what gets me excited is that, that it never ends, right? There's just so many stories to tell, uh, big and small, uh, when it comes to basketball. Uh, in terms of basketball, you know, I don't necessarily have something that I'm doing basketball related right or, now or sports is, yeah yeah sport, sure. sports yeah oh yeah for um, sure you know i'm hesitant to say on the sports side it's <laughs> it's it's real good ah, nice. I, i'll tell you guys off the air okay but it's <laughs> it's uh i can't i can't let it leak yet <laughs> that's cool what, uh, what, what, what do you have outside of sports what, what do you have and going then, on what, what what is there anything that you want to promote out that you guys have yeah, that's, so, that's coming uh, that you're excited for I, you know, I mentioned our back because I love big East Coast personalities and that sort of thing. I have a film coming out this year on a infamous New York City hip hop photographer named Ricky Powell. And his claim to fame was he was kind of like the fourth Beastie Boy. Nice. And he he sadly passed away uh, about six weeks ago. And um the film is going to premiere at the Tribeca Film Fest here in New York. Oh, nice. Congrats. And, you know, thank you. I appreciate that. And it's going to, uh, you know, be shown in a very big way uh, on a on a network we all know and love um, soon thereafter. And I'm, I'm super pumped about that. It's, a, it's awesome. like, it's just, it's kind of got that same um, energy that No Place Like Home had, you know? But yeah. it's like music and style and culture and all that kind of shit. So perfect. Yeah. You have to come it's back always, on, dude. Music doc. <laughs> yeah, for sure. It. It's always amazing to me how how intertwined basketball and hip hop are too. Like it's just like this this perfect symmetry between the two and and they like grew oh. up together. It's it's just a amazing thing. So Josh, we really appreciate you taking the time to come on. I know we took you away from some March Madness games. We took ourselves away too because our internet down here sucks so bad. We have to turn all the TVs <laughs> off when we do this. So we we all want to get back to see what the scores are and what's going on. But uh, we can't thank you enough, man. Thank you for taking the time. And and I'm loving what y'all are doing. Seriously, like you know what a, what a smart like unbelievable. Uh, business you guys have and like you know the shorts look unbelievable so thanks for having me really appreciate it man. my pleasure yeah thank you thank you for the kind words too and hopefully we'll have you back on here uh before too long you can pump whatever projects you have going on and uh, we love all of it so thanks again nice move by steve